I, I think there's a difference between what individual church members do and what, what the church endorses. Yeah, in, in other words, uh, we have a lot of church members that do a lot of things that the church doesn't approve of. You know, I, I know church members that drink, I know church members that smoke, I know church members that run around on their wives and their husbands. And uh, I don't approve of any of that, and I'm sure God does neither. Uh, but it's not, uh, we don't, we don't uh, endorse any of that at all. And so my feeling is that if an individual church member, member makes a choice of his own for some reason that he wants to do a certain modality, I'm not going to argue with him about it. But I don't want the church to endorse it. I don't want the church to participate on it. And I think that the church should take a stand and be clear about it. There may be, but I think we need to be very careful. Many herbs are simply passed down from century to century. Uh, as Elvin said, the quality of the advice associated with it is very questionable. There may be some herbs that are, that are helpful, uh, but we need to look at the science behind it. We also need to look at the philosophy behind it and uh, the tradition because there are certain herbal therapies that may have apparent benefit but which really are not the result of the herb but some other power. I might add one comment to this on herbs in the books that I have read and studying about many of the different <coughs> modalities through time, herbs were certainly one of the earliest substances used. But they were not used because of their biochemical properties. Those were totally un not understood. They were used perhaps uh, unlike cures like. If they looked like a certain substance, then they were used because of this appearance. If they were formed like a liver, they were good for the liver. Now, out of these thousands of substances, 50,000 in the museum in Beijing of different herbs, certainly there have been some fantastic substances found. But you got to remember, a vast majority of it was used, had no relevance to a biochemical prospect. They were yin or they were yang. I also might add that Herbs vary a great deal in the quantities or concentrations of the biologically active agents that are contained. It's very difficult to quantify what dose you might be getting of something that might be useful. Uh, because it varies just like nutrients do, depending on the number of hours of sunlight, the humidity and temperature, when it was harvested, its maturity when it was harvested. Uh, anybody who's been involved in the drug world and used marijuana knows that there's a huge difference um, in, in the concentrations of the biological active agent that gives the high from marijuana, uh, depending on many variables. Not only the strain, where it was grown, how it was harvested, what happened to it after it harvested, how much ultraviolet light it received, et cetera, et cetera. And when we're dealing with herbs, it's the same thing. How do we quantify what we're getting? And that makes it very difficult uh, from a scientific standpoint to even uh, quantify the benefits that might derive. And I think we need to realize that herbs are not without side effects. And there are many serious side effects associated with the use of herbs. And many people who use herbs have no idea what their dose is. So I think we need to use, it, use them very carefully. Yeah, well, one, one observation is that, uh, you know, tobacco is natural. It has a lot of side effects. Uh, you, uh, if you use it the way it's designed to be used, it'll kill you. Uh, arsenic is natural, and it's deadly. So just because something is natural does not mean that it's uh, free of side effects. Uh, one, one illustration about herbs, I, and I would, I would say that there is also a 
problem with herbs and a lot of other medications. Now, uh, in HIV positive people, they all have a lot of mental issues and there are a lot of there's a lot of depression. And uh, you've heard that St. John's wort is good for depression. So a lot of my patients on their own have taken St. John's worts. Well, it took us several years to find out that it interacts adversely with protease inhibitor drugs so that it lowers your protease inhibitor drug so you go in your viral load is high your immune system is deteriorating and you just shot yourself because you were taking something that you didn't talk to your doctor about now the truth is the interaction between a lot of uh, herbs and drugs are not really well studied or understood but now in HIV we know that uh, St. John's wort should not be used for depression if you're on HIV medication We've also found out that garlic does the same thing. Um, the, the other point that I think is worth making is that there is, not, there is not actually two kinds of medicines. I think it's uh, euphemistic when you say there's alternative medicine. There is not any alternative medicine. There's only one medicine. There is medicine that's been tested and proved, and there's medicine that hasn't been tested and hasn't been proved. And most of the alternative stuff is stuff that has not been tested and has not been proved. But because they have a food supplement name attached to it, they escape the scrutiny of the Food and Drug Administration. If the Food and Drug Administration had processed it, they would have had scientific studies to back it out, safety would have been very clearly outlined, and the efficacy would have had to have been proved. And by escaping the scrutiny of the FDA, they have really gotten a windfall because they can rush a product to market with no quality standards and with no uh, efficacy and with no safety. Boy, he handed me that mic in a hurry, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, let, 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 me give you, let me give you an illustration other than Vioxx, and then we'll comment on the Vioxx. Uh, the, I, I told you that the death rate from HIV has really gone down uh, and because we've got really effective drugs, okay? Now, one of the things that we have found out over time is that the protease inhibitors raise your cholesterol and triglycerides, and they also make you look like a diabetic, okay? Now, um, as a result, People with HIV who are on protease inhibitors tend to have more heart attacks and strokes. We understand that. But if they didn't take their drugs for HIV, they'd have died sooner anyway. And the drugs were licensed primarily for the HIV effects. And, and you have to understand that a drug that is tested and, and then rushed to market in a year or two because it saves people that have advanced AIDS, you're not going to understand the long-term side effects of a drug for maybe three, four, five, six years. And so drug companies are required by the Food and Drug Administration to have after-marketing uh, monitoring of potentially serious side effects. And, uh, and that allows you to weigh whether or not the drug should stay on the market. Yeah, uh, Vioxx is an extremely useful drug. It was a great anti-inflammatory drug. It reduced swelling, inflammation, pain, really helped people with arthritis. But once it had been on the market long enough, then we found that it uh, increased slightly the risk of coronary heart disease and stroke. That would not have showed up early in the study. But due to after-marketing analysis, they found it and they took it off the market. Now, if it was a life-saving drug, like an AIDS drug, they'd have left it on the market. And as I tell my patients who complain about their high cholesterols and their triglycerides, I'll say, you have to be alive to have complications. <laughs> you know, and the alternative was death in your case. And yes, this pill is having an adverse effect, but it's keeping you alive. And, uh, and if it's a life-saving drug, we put up with a lot of side effects. If it's a drug that's just for arthritis, for pity's sakes, we got 15 other drugs, take it off the market. But it's aftermarketing analysis that reveals these problems and allows us to pull it off. And we would not expect these problems to show up in the early phase one, two, or three testing. These only show up really in aftermarketing surveys, which are essential. I have not found any of the studies that showed there was any benefit for any reason. But there are types of fluctuating magnetic 
impulses that are used to help bones that are not healing well. There is some of it that is used uh, also fluctuating magnets for depression. But I understand also a lot of memory loss can occur with that type of therapy. <laughs> and uh, some people don't care for that. They <laughs> don't have room for that extra loss. <laughs> and so there, the, but of the stagnant ma magnets that you would put around your ankle, around your wrist, or in your shoes, probably uh, would be a, a zero. The only thing, I, I've not studied into that one specifically much. I noticed it was included with all the somatic uh, therapies. And maybe you saw that list I gave there. And as I made the one comment, uh, there wasn't a dime's worth of difference complex. between any of them. Uh, and I'm just not going to get bo bogged down studying into them. It isn't worth it. I have found none in my study, and I've looked at it rather extensively. Um, one might construe a few things uh, that could be, uh, but I think that's an artificial construction, and I think we have to realize when we look at its roots and the philosophy in which it's based, and um, the, the statements of those who are not trying to hide anything, but are openly telling what this modality does and why it does what it does. It's very clear to me that it falls in this same category that we've been talking about all weekend of occultic practices under different names and different terminology. The one paper that I read concerning the quotes inner physician that's the energy inside that the practitioner was dialoguing with uh, in manners of the supposed pulsation of the brain that would come 12 to 15 per cycles per minute would cease for 10 minutes when there would be a, a no answer in other words there would be questions asked the inner physician would answer on, in this paper by ceasing the uh, pulsations that were claimed to occur through the central nervous system, which I don't believe exist. I have no confidence in such uh, on there. And it was nothing but divination. I think, th I think, Jay, that the inner physician, as I understand it in the context of CST, is a very dangerous concept. Um, because it assumes that on the cellular level there is intelligence and that there is the ability on the cellular level, almost a molecular level, to have memory of trauma and the therapist in the right setting and with the right, feeling the right vibrations and saying the right words can enter into a conversation with the inner physician who will then direct that patient to the proper um, activities that will cure their problem. And to me, that's really scary. It's, it's, it's really pantheistic, and there's a strong component of mind control. They're doing some really amazing things in nanotechnology, uh, uh, working down at the level of just a few, molecule, a few mole uh, molecules of elements, basic elements. They're able to construct machines that actually work. They're able to construct motors that actually run. 
and the like, and uh, these uh, things are uh, smaller than the width of a human hair. You could have a hundred of them across a human hair. They're, they're so small. And, and of course, the, the thought is, is that if you can find a way of programming them and sending them somewhere and putting sensors on them, you know, they might be able to do sub-microscopic repairs at the cellular level, and uh, it's a kind of ultra-micro robotics uh, and uh, this uh, is an uh, area of active research. I plan to go into it myself when I get to heaven. B uh, <laughs> but not until then, because I need to worry about other people's souls first. <laughs>
uh, illness was looked at as being caused by demons. And that's where the exorcist really uh, came out of. They would go to the uh, priest and he would exorcise, ex you spell it, uh, yeah, he would do this procedure and that was a, where it became really common in Western Europe and came to America uh, on there. What happened before that, I don't know, but I do know that there was relationship there during that period of time of the dark, dark ages. We uh, had a uh, elderly pastor who would be well known to you if I mention his name. Uh, he passed away many years ago down in Texas, but he got into the exorcism thing about 25 years ago, and uh, and uh, one of the ladies that he had exorcised uh, was found uh, Sunday morning uh, in his backyard, hung herself from a tree. That was the last exorcism he ever did. There's a lot of attempts to do that. And uh, we need to be aware of that. But I don't think you can baptize and make, I mean, you can, uh, an example that I used recently may not be quite as appropriate. Well, I think it's very, it's very graphic, but you can take a streetwalker and dress them up in the most modest, appropriate clothes. But it does not change what they are inside. Only the grace of God can do that. And God can only work through certain modalities. And he's prevented from working through those that originated with the great deceiver. I, I think that this this is this is a really good good question, and uh, I think that uh, uh, salvation is a very personal thing, and uh, you know when it's happened to you because you have the assurance uh, that's written in Scripture, and you have the assurance within your heart that the Holy Spirit has given you, and you have it manifested on your face and in your actions. And uh, I, I think that scientists, by and large, haven't been interested in documenting Christian experience. But I think it could be documented very, very easily. And, uh, but it's also true that a scientist cannot attack you or discredit you for what you know you've experienced. You can never argue with somebody's personal experience. I, I don't try to do it. Well, I think that I think that oils are are useful lubrication if you're doing a massage or something like that, and uh, you know if you're using some oils to uh, to en uh, enhance uh, contact with the skin, I think that that's probably appropriate. To spend ten times as much when you could use baby oil is probably inappropriate, and I, I don't know that there's any particular value in an essential oil. I think its value comes in its lubricating properties, and uh, as some oils, of course, if they're if they uh, are peppermint oil or something like that, might actually have a an anesthetic property that might be useful to them. Uh, but uh, you know beyond its usefulness for lubrication or anesthesia, I don't think oils have any particular benefit. That question is no doubt in reference to the chart that I used in my presentation yesterday afternoon. And um, that was developed particularly in light of filtering um, alternative therapies and the subject of what we're discussing this weekend subjects but um, I think that could be modified and many of the same principles would apply in general Thank you. I think that we need to be very careful and critical of those things which sweep through in fads within the church various programs, various uh, ideas of growing large. Uh, I mean, we're all, I mean, we are interested in seeing God's work progress and move forward in this world, but we need to make sure that the methods are consistent with the
Bible and with the spirit of prophecy that God has given to us. And we need to look at the history and the roots of many of those philosophies and make sure that they meet the same standards that we've been talking about here. Uh, vinegar is uh, acetic acid. Uh, it's a fairly uh, weak acid as far as acid goes. Uh, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, uh, hydrochloric acid are much stronger acids. Uh, uh, but it does, it can upset the acid-base balance of the body and, uh, and uh, as a rule, vinegar really should not, not be used in any quantity uh, whatsoever. Yeah, sleep apnea is, is an interesting phenomena. It, it, it uh, is uh, when people stop breathing uh, during sleep, and sometimes they won't breathe for 30 seconds or 45 seconds, sometimes even longer, and the oxygen level in your bloodstream will, will decrease uh, substantially during that time. And if your heart is operating on, uh, on inadequate circulation, this can actually increase your risk of sudden death and things like that. Sometimes this is due to abnormalities in the upper airway. Uh, it's a frequent problem in people that are significantly overweight. And a CPAP machine uh, provides continuous positive pressure in the upper airway and, uh, and it, gives, it keeps the, the airway open. And it really does not increase the oxygen level in your bloodstream and most of them run off of room air. And so it's just a method of increasing pressure so as to keep your upper airway open. Uh, then people breathe more normally and their oxygen saturation stays up to normal and it, it really decreases the risk of dying uh, for people that have the problem. Uh, very often if they, uh, if they are overweight, if they lose a significant amount of weight, uh, then the problem is corrected and they don't need the CPAP machine anymore. But very often people will wake up, uh, your body doesn't want to die, and uh, you're, you will actually wake up, then you'll gasp and breathe a few times, then you'll try to go back to sleep. So people with sleep apnea really don't sleep well, and they do not get deep levels of sleep. It's not restorative sleep because they've come up to nearly being conscious, sometimes hundreds of times a night. And, uh, and so not getting good sleep also has bad uh, metabolic effects on you. And so if you use the BiPAP machine, people get the deep sleep, the restorative sleep that they need, and uh, it, it's health restoring in, in many ways. Uh, TENS units are, are kind of interesting. They're little uh, electronic uh, devices. You put electrodes uh, near uh, where the pain is. Usually, if you have neck pain, you could put electrodes on your neck or on your ear. And, uh, and you can turn, uh, there are some dials on it. You can uh, adjust the uh, amount of electricity that's delivered through a little battery pack. And uh, you can uh, change the intensity of it and the frequency of it. And uh, sometimes uh, this will give a person uh, some significant pain relief. Uh, I can tell you that I'm, I'm not impressed with TENS units. Uh, I have had patients that have had them and uh, they will say, oh, this has helped quite a bit. And I almost think it's kind of a placebo effect uh, because nobody uses them for very long. You know, I, you check with them a month later, yeah, I and, agree. and nobody's using yeah. their tens unit. Why? It's not working. Yeah, I agree. I've I've used it a lot of times with people because you do everything you can, especially those that have had an accident where they were been hit from behind, and the car, the neck is strained, and they're you can just tell in their eyes the misery, and when they get well, their eyes look different, uh, just the way they hold the tissues around them, and the tens unit. You gave it, and I th suspect every physician here would agree with this, it's not a dramatic relief. But how it's supposed to work is to fatigue the nerves by electrical currents, to fatigue the carrying of the, of the impulse down the nerve. It's not a magic thing. And doctor, I'm a little concerned about what you said about being able to tell it by looking in their eyes. <laughs> I'm, I'm a stargazer.
right, if you put an electrode into the leg and you've, you've had a stroke, you've lost the function of a leg, and uh, you want those muscles to function and you want the person to be thinking about constantly trying to make it come back, uh, and you're, you're just seeing the oscilloscope here where it's the electrical impulse from the muscle, from your nerve to the muscle, I've thought about that, and I, I'm not going to criticize that. It's not quite like hooking up everything and checking your brain wave, and uh, you go through a mantra and a visualization and so forth. You're not doing that here, and so I would qualify that a little bit. What can be done is a difficult question that's in part why we're having this weekend because education is so important. Uh, we may not be able to legislate, but we can educate. And decisions are made uh, by groups of people who have knowledge and experience and conviction. And uh, that's probably the most effective tool. I'm very concerned about the same things. And I, several, well, probably more than a year ago now, I ran across a very interesting article written by a, by a Hindu Swami who was taking exception to the fact that yoga, and particularly Hatha yoga, which has been promulgated in this country, in the Western world, as being stripped of its Hindu spiritual roots, was taking strong exception to the fact that that was being done. And again, it's, it's like the question that came up last evening. Can we, can we use these things in a way that's consistent with Christian belief and thought? And I don't think we can, because we cannot separate the roots and the philosophy of those roots from the practice. And so we can, we can substitute Bible verses and make it look like it's been Christianized, but it's still the same animal because it came from the same place and the same source and the same author. Let's give a biblical example of that. And I think Christ left this for our illustration, and, uh, but it's resulted in frustration. And I think the Lord knew that, and that's why he gave us the illustration. But in the Bible, you remember the story of, uh, of the uh, poor beggar that died and went to Abraham's bosom. And uh, the, the rich man, Lazarus, uh, died and went to hell. And, uh, and there, uh, he said, wouldn't, wouldn't you please give me a drop of water? Do you know that story that Jesus told uh, is taken out of its context and twisted and used as a justification for an everlasting burning hell in which people communicate back and forth? But those concepts were prevalent in Christ's day, mm. and he was using common words and illustrations to make a point. And the truth is, by doing that, he has proven that it creates problems that last for a long time. And <laughs> And I think he intended to, to, uh, uh, for us to learn from that. And so I think that in our schools and in our churches, we should be extremely careful never to use any of those words or any of those ideas or concepts. So, you know, if you want to meditate, you should, because the Bible says whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are true. Think on those things, right? Hey, that's meditation. Don't use the word yoga because it has a rich and complex meaning, and you may mean it to mean meditation, but you're going to, leave some, you're going to lead somebody astray by using that word. And I think that goes for all of the other words of all of these other healings. We don't need those words. We don't need those concepts, because we have the Bible. We have the words that Jesus used. We have the words of our own tradition. We have our own faith. And so if, if you want to extract uh, from something a practice that you think is really good, look, see if it's in the Bible, see if Jesus did it, see if the apostles did it. If so, do it, but use Jesus' words, use the apostles' words, and strip it of the vocabulary and techniques that you get from other places. I 
listen to the words of a guru who had been a guru, now a Christian. His words were, you cannot take Hinduism out of yoga, and you cannot take yoga out of Hinduism. And then I also saw recently the written words of another uh, graduate of the Hindu University they have here in the United States, essentially the same words. It is still Hinduism, period. Uniting with the spirit of Brahman. I am very concerned today about a word that Adventists are using widely that carries a lot of baggage that we don't realize what it carries, and that's the word vegan. Yes. Seventh-day Adventists are not vegans. The Spirit of Prophecy does not call or make an appeal to vegan diets. If we wish to uh, you eliminate animal products from our diets, we are pure vegetarians or complete vegetarians and that does not have the philosophical baggage that the word vegan has. Now, again, it, it's widely used, and I hear it more and more. Well, I'm this, I'm this. I was, at a, I was at a church potluck recently where I was speaking, and you know, I went through the line, and here was a sign, and it says, this is the vegan section. Um, I'm not sure how they determined that, but obviously somebody asked everybody that brought the dishes, um, and it could only be put in certain sections. The word vegan emanates and comes from philosophical vegetarianism, where you're opposed to the killing of animals and the use of leather in all forms. And, it, and that's, that whole philosophy goes back really to Eastern or New Age thinking. And I think we need to be really careful with the words we choose. We can be pure vegetarians or complete vegetarians. And that's probably all I ought to say now. <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry in its history, and, it, and it's not, the pharmaceutical industry does not wear a halo. Uh, it's a highly competitive, money-oriented industry like all other industries in this world. Highly competitive. But there are certain standards that they have to live up to if they're going to be able to market products. And historically, all of the basic herbs have been evaluated by every company because they would love to be able to find an herb, identify the bioactive substance or substances, synthesize those substances, and put them into a pill and sell them. But they have not been able to either establish satisfactory efficacy or safety standards. And, um, and so they've not, as a result, been able to patent them or sell them. And um, the fact is, interestingly, that they actually do sell them. And they're the largest providers. That same industry that is criticized by many for their prescription medications and so forth also own and distribute and sell herbal products. In fact, they're the largest distributors of those. They're the owners. They've got a corner on the market. They know where the money is. I don't know if I should enter the fray at this point, you know, uh, about this subject, but let, let me just make, make an observation. Uh, in one of the largest studies ever done uh, by Dr. Takeshi Hirayama in uh, Japan, uh, they, they found that uh, they uh, studied uh, 285,000 people and they followed them for 20 years one of the biggest studies ever done in the world. And uh, they had a lot of lifestyle data. They knew if they smoked or didn't smoke. They knew if they ate meat or didn't eat meat. They know if they ate green and yellow vegetables every day or didn't eat green and yellow vegetables every day. And they found that the people that got the most lung cancer were the people that ate meat every day and smoked cigarettes every day. 
Uh, interestingly enough, they had another group of people that ate meat every day and smoked cigarettes every day, but ate green and yellow vegetables every day. And if you added green and yellow vegetables to your bad lifestyle, it reduced your risk of lung cancer by about 35 or 40 percent. It also reduced the risk of larynx cancer by about 50 percent, esophagus cancer by 30 to 40 percent, and a lot of cancers. So it became immediately known from this entirely huge, huge study that you eating green and yellow vegetables uh, had a protective effect. And so it's not just that smoking is bad for you or uh, uh, meat eating is bad for you, but eating green and yellow vegetables was highly protective, even if you still had bad habits. Then, of course, they had people in there that didn't smoke every day, didn't eat meat every day, and ate green and yellow vegetables. Their risk of lung cancer was reduced by 98%, larynx cancer by 90%, esophagus cancer by 70%, lymphoma by 45%, so on and so forth. So, and those were Seventh Adventists, and he identified Seventh Adventists in the studies as being the healthiest people in the world which uh, was very unique. But what the pharmaceutical industry picked up on was that if you eat green and yellow vegetables every day, you are protected. So they said, what is causing that? And they said, it has to be due to the antioxidants because cigarette smoke is so toxic. So what we need to do is we need to have a pill that has the antioxidants in it. So what we'll do is we'll have a study of smokers and we will give them beta carotene, we'll give them uh, other potent antioxidants, and we'll see if we can have a pill that will prevent lung cancer. Now, and you can keep on smoking. Now, they recognize that the best thing to do is to quit smoking, but if we could put it in a pill they could take a pill every day, and until they changed their lifestyle, it would give them some protection. A good idea. So they, uh, NCI thought it was great. That's National Cancer Institute thought it was a great uh, idea. They enrolled 25,000 smokers and a control group, and they spent $50 million on the study. And it was cut short in two years because those who smoked and took the antioxidants had a 25% increase in the risk of lung cancer. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's very interesting. And I think it makes a very important point. You mess with God's food, you screw it up. <laughs> what really counts is the green and yellow vegetables. And I am just flabbergasted when people say, I've got a little pill here that has the distilled product of all the fruits. Here I've got a pill that's got all the vegetables in it. Here I've got a pill that's got this and that. And you look at the pill, it looks nothing like the fruits. It looks nothing like the vegetables. And I'll say, what in the world did you do to God's good food? You know, and why would you want to take that? You know, and they'll say, well, you know, our soils are depleted and, and food is no good anymore. And, uh, and I, I think of the text in Genesis where after the flood, God promised Noah, uh, uh, as long as time will last, there's going to be what? Seed time and harvest. What's, what promise is there? I'm going to feed you. And you're going to have summer and winter, and there's never going to be a flood destroy everything again. And so when I talk to people, why do you take that? They all say, well, I take it just in case just in case the food is really inadequate and I'm trying to make sure that everything is covered. And I said, well, do you ever go to church on Sunday? I mean, just in case. <laughs> you know? And, and they say, no, no, I, I never do that. And I said, well, do you thank God at your meal? And they said, oh, yes, I always thank God at my meal. And I said, well, that's awfully two-faced of you to say, thank you, God, for the abundance that which you provided. But since I know that you've allowed my food to deteriorate and become useless, I bought this pills to make up for your deficiency. <laughs> and so, in fact, to use a lot of these concentrated products or things, you know, is actually a statement of distrust in God. Amen. Because God said he would feed you. Until he comes, there will be seed time and harvest. Now, if the soil is, de is depleted, it's, it will not grow, or you'll only get half as much. But if it looks like a carrot, smells like a carrot, tastes like a carrot, it has all of the elements that God wanted carrots to have. Amen. 
Now, if you grow it on some other soil, it may have a slightly different chemical composition, but it'll have all of those 400 carotenes that are in there that have wonderful antioxidant properties, and, I'd ra and I need antioxidants to protect me from other people's cigarette smoking and from air pollution and things like that, and I'm gonna get it from the carrots that God provided me and thank him for it. The mention of Dr. Hariyama in Japan, I was working in the Far Eastern Division, and he had just reported um, his major study at an international conference, and he happened to arrive. I didn't know he arrived the same day that I arrived in Japan for a trip through Japan and some classes and seminars with our workers. And, but I was there for two weeks in Japan, and during those two weeks, an amazing thing happened. The, the Japanese newspapers picked up this actually very, very well-known epidemiologist's work, and, and he was internationally known. But he had used in a news conference a phrase in Japanese to describe the group in his study that had the greatest advantage. And he had used a term that in English meant Adventist food. <laughs> and we have, uh, Japan has a very highly oiled marketing mechanism and industry. And the, all, all the food industry within, it happened while I was there in Japan in those two weeks. They put yellow flags across their advertisements for safflower oil and mayonnaise that was made, and it said, an Adventist food. <laughs> and it became an embarrassment to the Adventist church. And the church had nothing to do with it. And Dr. Hariyama actually went on national television and asked the industry to remove those, those advertisements or labels from the food. But it's, it had that much of an impact in Japan. <laughs> the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, depends on how you define organic, and of course today we have a little different meaning to it, and words change uh, in this country. Uh, in particular, really has, trans has come across the Atlantic from, from Europe where we're behind uh, in this area of thinking. Um, and all of the, I give you my perspective. Uh, if you can find organic food that is, looks good and tastes good, you can grow your own, I think that's great. We're commended to do that. On the other hand, we need to realize that the studies that have looked at the importance of fruits and vegetables, and we see that huge emphasis today in the area of nutrition, it's the hottest area of study in nutrition, the benefits of fruits and vegetables. I never thought I would live to see that day. Right. Right. Uh, I pe meet people on the airplane all the time. Oh, you're a vegetarian. Well, then you eat lots of fruits and vegetables. It used to be, oh, you're a vegetarian, what do you eat? Yeah. Only salads? The world has changed. And the world of nutrition has changed. But all of those studies that show the powerful benefits of a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains are not done on what we would define as organic products. If you have the budget, and within your thinking of stewardship, you can spend it, go ahead. It's probably not harmful. Well, I can tell you I go to the, to the store here in town, the, the full grocery store. It's, we don't have a Trader's Joe, but, or Trader's Joe, but um, I go to the store here in town and I look at their organic fruits. And having spent 10 years in Yakima, um, and knowing what a good Washington apple is, I look at their fruits and vegetables and I say, who would eat those? Ellen White has a very interesting statement, and if you want to see me afterwards, I'll look it on my computer. I don't have it right here. She says that until the Lord comes, as a result of sin, deterioration of this world, 
there are bugs and they must be sprayed. Now most Adventists don't, are not aware of that, but go to the E.G. White CD-ROM and look at it. You'll find it. It's very easy to find. Having lived, and I'll just give you a little different perspective, having lived outside of this country, having grown up on an orange grove, having lived in the Yakima Valley where I watched the orchardists and growing all of the fruit that we all enjoy and that are so important to our health, and knowing a little bit about the regulations that are imposed upon farmers in this country in terms of what can be sprayed when and the known half-lives and all of these issues, very complicated, high science on our products. And having lived in the Philippines, where the farmer who produced most of the food that was available there would put a backpack sprayer on his back he struggled to read the label on the herbicide or on the pesticide that he sprayed, but he knew that if he sprayed it, he got a bigger crop and that translated a little more money for his family. That there was prevalent the idea that, and they called it medicine out in the, in the rural areas. It was just plant medicine. It was the same as they gave to their children. I mean, it was medicine. It was a, I mean, different substances, but it, generically they looked at it as medicine. And I heard it over and over when I would go out and do meetings and talks, that there was a prevalent idea that the more the medicine, the greater the benefit. And I'll tell you, those things were applied off-label in quantities that would curl your hair that would curl any orchardist or farmer's hair if they knew what had happened. And yet, in the small studies that have been done in countries like that, those who eat more fruits and vegetables have the greatest advantage. I don't think the Lord made it difficult. We're very blessed. I'm glad to be an American. I'm glad to be able to have the food supply that we have available to us. But I am not convinced that there are any inherent advantages, and I haven't seen any data that would support, good, solid data that would support the concepts that I hear so often that we need to avoid totally anything that isn't grown naturally. And we need to remember the statement of Ellen White that said, until the end of time, we need to spray to take care of these pests.